at the Rodney Mamepa uh, Media Center in Pretoria. I'd also like to welcome all our colleagues joining us on our YouTube page today um, that are following us virtually. Thank you for joining us. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, I'll hand over right over to our panelists uh, as soon as I've done a bit of housekeeping. The first thing is that um, to those of us who are joining us online, you may ask questions, you may participate. Please can you ask your questions on the WhatsApp group that's being managed by the GCIS. I think the colleagues know that WhatsApp group. Um, the second thing is that our media statement will be shared shortly along with the graphics that summarize the National Infrastructure Plan. So please make use of that to be able to phrase and ask your questions. Um, today we have two panelists that are joining us to do the briefing on the NIP, that being the National Infrastructure Plan. The first is our Minister responsible for Public Works and Infrastructure, Ms. Patricia DeLille. She'll start, um, give an overview and um, a bit of detail on how we got to this point. The second panelist is Dr. Hosi Ansuram Kupa, who's Head of Infrastructure South Africa and Head of Infrastructure and Investments in the Presidency, who will give a bit more detail on the sectors as outlined in the NIP. After Dr. Ramkupa, he'll hand back over to Minister Dillo to be able to speak to some of the improvements and some of the progress that has been made on the NIP already. So I'll hand over to Minister Dillo. Um, it's not like in Cape Town, you'll have to stand up and come to the podium, please, and address us from here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Goedemiddag. And welcome to all of you here today. And uh, my partner, Dr. Jose Saramahopa, and the ISAC team, team from DPWI. Uh, we're very pleased today uh, to present to you the National Infrastructure Plan up to 2050. But not only the plan up to 2050, also the implementation of the very same plan for the next three years. Uh, in May of 2020, uh, Cabinet approved and adopted the infrastructure plan. And that infrastructure investment plan consists of projects that we receive from national departments, provincial departments, uh, municipalities and also state-owned entities. But we put all of those projects through what we call a sustainable infrastructure de development methodology to make sure that they are bankable before we took them to the market. Now many of these projects, 62 of them, are already in construction and they're providing the much needed jobs in our economy but also to revive uh, the construction industry. So in approving the infrastructure investment plan in 2020, cabinet also agreed that we establish Infrastructure South Africa, uh, which is headed by Dr. Jose Enzo Ramahopa. And the key role of ISA is to drive implementation, but also to seek the necessary funding for all our infrastructure projects and make sure that we expedite implementation. So um, Dr. Ramachopa and his team has worked for many months now on uh, the uh, National Infrastructure Plan for 2050. Uh, because we need to have a more long-term view on infrastructure so that we can drive um, economic growth and social transformation, but also to achieve the national development plan and to bring certainty within uh, the construction industry in the built environment about what the future plans of government will be. And so on August uh, uh, 2021, uh, Cabinet then approved uh, that we can gazette the National Infrastructure Plan for public participation. And we will give you an annexure of all the organizations that we have consulted. We've just about consulted everybody under the sun. We then, I then further extended the pu public participation for another two weeks uh, to enable us to also consult with 
SADC as a regional body, and also the African Union Infrastructure Commission. Uh, because infrastructure must cross the borders of South Africa in view of the fact that we also have the African Free Trade Agreement now. And so we then also know what infrastructure development is taking place in the rest of the region and in the continent. And then um, following this, these consultations um, with more broadly with additional stakeholders, uh, we, we then took it back to cabinet, but we incorporated a lot of the written, especially the written submissions that we've received. We've received uh, written submissions from organizations like Business Unity South Africa, Business Leadership South Africa, uh, organizations like the World uh, uh, Wildlife Organization. And I, I can tell you today that there's huge support for this plan because it does bring certainty to the built environment. And then all the key changes that were proposed by all the stakeholders, we've incorporated uh, those changes into the National Infrastructure Plan to strengthen uh, the plan completely. And some of the commitments that we have made uh, in, the, in the NIP 2050 is that we have committed to address crime and corruption uh, focusing on vandalizing of uh, state assets, the theft of state assets, uh, the corruption in procurement, extortion and political unrest that hinders the implementation of infrastructure. Um, we also focus on industrial development and localization, and the whole plan is designed for implementation. But we've also aligned the, the 50 year plan with the national development plan and also with the national spatial development framework of government that will be approved by cabinet in the next two weeks. Because it's important that we use the national spatial development framework to guide us where the infrastructure is needed the most so that we can can prioritize, but the National Spatial Development Framework also assists us to once and for all deal with the apartheid spatial planning. We need to integrate our cities, we need to integrate our towns, we need to make sure that well-located land close to opportunities uh, is, is used for the purpose of integration. Unfortunately, after 1994, we continued with the apartheid spatial planning by putting our people far away from opportunities. If you look at the houses were built uh, far away, the poor spend about 40% of their income just on transport. And this plan is correcting that. We are going to use the well-located land in cities, in towns, in provinces uh, to, to integrate our country. So the the need for, for infrastructure to generate employment, but also to transform the build environment. So broad-based black economic empowerment is key in our plan to create those opportunities. And then with the municipalities, we will arrange a performance-based support for municipalities in maintenance and also the building system. We know that there's a great need for maintenance and repairs, especially in our municipalities, and part of the plan will also deal with um, maintenance. So specific areas have been strengthened in response uh, to departmental and other stakeholder inputs, and as I said, they have been incorporated into a, a NIP 2050. Let me just briefly deal with the strategic focus of the National Infrastructure Plan 2015. The plan is there to de develop a coherent plan towards development for our country infrastructure networks. Um, and 
for these uh, networks to achieve sustainability over the medium term, long term, and what we need to do immediately. And like I said, it is aligned to the National Development Plan. It's also aligned to the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Council, which is chaired by the president and meets every on a quarterly basis. And then it's also aligned, like I said, to the National Spatial Development Framework. So uh, the timing is great uh, for this plan as we at the same time also now um, uh, finalize the spatial development framework. So the strategic in the intervention that we want to make will address the overall government's objective of improving and investing in core network infrastructure such as water, energy, freight transport, uh, digital communication infrastructure. So we will also, like I say, we, are, we begin to prioritize the infrastructure within the plan. So the, one of the top priorities of the, of the NIP 2050 is to ensure the foundations are in place to uh, achieve transformation, to achieve inclusive growth and infrastructure and uh, investment uh, to deal with spatial integration and also the expansion of um, uh, urban economies and rur rural development. So the NIP 2050 really offers us a strategic vision of where we want to go. Another purpose of NIP 50 is to promote a dynamism in infrastructure delivery, address the institutional blockages and weaknesses that hinder success over the longer term, and also guide us to build more uh, vital institutions. Like we have started now with the building of uh, establishment of Infrastructure South Africa, but already Infrastructure South Africa is establishing another institution and a special purpose vehicle that will specifically look at social infrastructure. Social infrastructure, we mean our schools, we need to eradicate mud schools, we need to deal with ablution facilities. So already we are beginning to put those uh, institutions in place. So the infrastructure delivery model in South Africa also depends a lot on state-owned entities. But still in South Africa, we are not benefiting from this model of using our own state-owned entities because the institutional framework does not support performance and adaptation. So in all the sectors that I've mentioned, this adaptation and continuous response and improvement are critical to the success of the implementation of this plan. The NIP 2050 also focus on the foundational network infrastructure in energy, in freight transport, in water and digital communications. So this is the first phase of the plan. The second phase of the plan will focus on distributed infrastructure, commuted transport, and municipal services uh, to be finalized and this second phase will be finalized within the 22-23 financial year. I will now hand over to Dr. Ramahopa to deal with some of the, the detailed plans of what we have implemented already and, um, and, and, and how we are going to, uh, under the leadership of Dr. Kutenzo Ramahopa and Isa that will be driving the implementation because that has been our weakness has come to implementation. And now finally, we are beginning to get implementation going, of course, with the partnership of the private sector. Over to you, Doc. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister, and let me take the opportunity to greet everyone uh, present here in your eminence, but also just to pay tribute to the Minister for having provided leadership and stewardship uh, in ensuring that uh, the, the, the MIP uh, culminates into a cabinet vision and therefore it becomes a program for execution by, by the entire country. So I want to thank the Minister for that. So just to re-emphasize the point that the Minister has uh, indicated is that uh, the National Infrastructure Plan takes uh, what I refer to as twin, twin tracks that are sequential. So what we are presenting before you today really has to do with what the Minister referred to as uh, foundational network in that uh, sector. So that's energy, water, transport, and ICT infrastructure. So what is the significance of this for a uh, foundational network uh, sectors? Is that one, they ensure that there's universal access and by definition they improve the quality of life of uh, our people in keeping with the provision, uh, constitutional injunctions and also the aspirational targets of the NDP. And secondly, is that they introduce efficiency in the economy, they're able to enhance uh, the competitiveness uh, of the country, making sure that uh, raw goods are able to get to, to markets or where they could uh, be beneficiation and, and creation of jobs, but also expand, if you like, the tentacles of our economy beyond the, the, domestic, uh, the domestic market. Um, and then the, the fourth one is that, the, the third one is that it's able to ensure that we, we are able to achieve what we call spatial justice, like the minister has indicated, is that uh, the spatial configuration of the country is that the poor are excluded in, in, in many ways. So also in physical terms, they are far away from uh, employment opportunities. They spend on average 40% of their incomes uh, just on uh, uh, transportation. Uh, they spend about 40% of their uh, of their time just uh, commuting between uh, between work and places of uh, of opportunity. So we want to address uh, the spatial configurations, and of course, they're also going to have uh, other spillover um, effects. In that, we are going to re reduce the, the, the carbon uh, emissions, if you like, uh, reliance on um, on fossil fossil fuels. So that's the significance of the four. So that's what we are presenting before you. And then the next phase that has already started really is what the minister refers to as a distributed uh, infrastructure. So essentially it's what we can refer to as the last mile. So the first part of uh, the NIP were dealing, let's take water on the water resources side. So if you like the water balance that is, uh, we know we are a water scarce country, how we are able to harness and exploit some of the resources that are there. So we have sufficient capacity, but it doesn't talk to how you get it to to the house, so you must uh, still uh, uh, install um, infrastructure, if you like, uh, pipe water networks to ensure that the water reaches the house. So that's the next phase of uh, of, uh, of this uh, national infrastructure plan. So what are we saying in relation to energy? So the first thing is that the, the constitutional injunction says that uh, there must be universal access. By universal access, we simply mean everyone must be connected to the grid, must have access to uh, the energy that they require at the time that they require. Of course, you know that we've got major problems with regards to the provision of uh, electricity on the supply side, if you like, the generation capacity, there's 4,000 deficit of megawatt, and that's why we have been uh, uh, load shedding um, uh, 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 from time to time in the country. So the president has uh, indicated that there's a need for us to be able to close that gap uh, others put it at 4,000, others could put it at 8,000, but the key is that we need to, to provide for, for that uh, deficit. And we know that uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the NDP, the projections are that uh, we need to double, if you like, the installed capacity of uh, energy in the country from about 53 gigawatts. We should be anything, uh, anything between 123 to 124. Uh, 74 gigawatts by 2050. And we know that uh, in terms of the integrated resource plan, there's going to be an energy mix. Of course, you are not going to abandon your reliance on coal, but uh, progressively, each share of, uh, of the pie of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the energy mix is going to reduce. And then, of course, you are going to bolster, if you like, the, 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 the contribution of, uh, of renewables. Now, one of the issues that the cabinet raised was that Let's not talk about 2050 when, in fact, the problems are now and today. So what is it that we are doing on the energy front today? So you know that there's been multiple uh, big windows, uh, approximately 5 gigawatt of power, um, been uh, introduced uh, through these uh, multiple uh, phases of, uh, 
of uh, big windows. They happen on a biannual, uh, biannual basis. Of course, not all of it uh, is uh, introduced to the grid. Of course, uh, the last uh, window, we know that uh, the, uh, the, the preferred bidders now are going through a process of, uh, of financial, financial growth. The second thing that we have done now is uh, in relation to the reform agenda, you know that there's uh, a dispensation that has been introduced of uh, 100 megawatts of uh, uh, self-generation. You don't have to go through the onerous requirements uh, in, in relation to permitting and licensing. And the intention there is to allow the big users to exploit opportunities around renewables to ensure that uh, we are able to at least uh, close that gap that we have been uh, we, we are referring to. And one of the ambitions that we are doing now is to ensure that there's about 800 to 1,000 megawatts of, uh, of battery storage. So you know some of the weaknesses with regards to renewables is that uh, they don't necessarily satisfy your base load. So you, you, you're you using it when the sun is there, that radiation levels are at the right levels, when the wind is uh, at the right speed. But when it's absent, it therefore means that you are losing opportunities from generating energy from renewables. So if you, if you like, uh, there's been significant innovation advances in relation to battery storage. So you can store that at the time that you need it. When there's peak demand, you are able to exploit, if you like, uh, that uh, battery storage. So that's the work that we're doing. So we're not talking here 2050. is a work that is visible, that is happening today. And then the third area in relation to what we'll be doing now as we speak is to identify the 10 uh, mega users from a municipal point of view, work with them to exploit the 100 megawatt uh, uh, dispensation and also to address what the minister has referred to, the building challenges that, uh, that are there and, uh, and also the distribution capacity in those, uh, in those municipalities. So we're working with them, of course, with SALGA and many other bodies to address that situation. And then we had introduced just the other day the green hydro hydrogen strategy as the next frontier of opportunities for the country uh, to place us on a different economic pedestal. The Northern Cape has already adopted uh, their green hydrogen strategy. You know, we're working on uh, a deep sea port called Bukubai. It will be used for purposes of ensuring that uh, we create export opportunities for green hydrogen. So what is the point I'm making? We're not waiting for 2050. We are addressing the situation now. Of course, uh, the culmination of this uh, will help us to achieve those uh, targets by 2050. And then on transport, uh, so transport, we are not focusing on the entirety of the ecosystem of transport. We are only focusing for this purposes on freight transport. So the intention is to move uh, uh, freight from, uh, to be from being rail-based, uh, road-based to being rail-based. We know that uh, the N3 corridor carries a substantive amount of uh, the country's GDP and of course, uh, is exposed to interruptions if uh, there are uh, uh, disruption service delivery protests along the, the corridor, if there's a uh, tracker strike, they undermine the performance of the economy, uh, competitiveness, the extent to which we are able to access markets. So it's important. And then, of course, there are operational costs. I mean, the time that it takes for you road base to get to, to the port, uh, the cost of getting to the port when, in fact, you can move uh, a significant amount of goods uh, through through rail. So we, we are articulating that uh, the prospect of uh, of rail to enhance competitiveness, market access, and broaden our our our, our market. Like I said, doesn't it seems it to be just a domestic? Of course, one of the major bottlenecks there is around the the performance of uh, of the ports, and we know that Transnet Freight Rail uh, will be implementing both accounting and commercial separation providing a sound basis to evaluate and accommodate third-party rail operators uh, into the future. So it's a significant insertion in the freight transport ecosystem in the country that we are creating opportunities for third parties to, to also participate in, that, in this space. So this is not something for 2050, it's something that uh, Transnet is working on now. And the other one is around the, the improvement of uh, our small harbors from uh, their contributions to the performance of, uh, of the economy. So Minister DeMille, through one of our SIPs, we have already um, unveiled uh, some of the interventions we are making at the small harbors. So it's not uh, just about uh, exploiting uh, the fishing resources, but it's about expanding opportunities to ensure that uh, small harbors becomes a magnet for economic activity in those small towns. So we, we have done unveiled a few of them. So the point I'm making is not just about the uh, 2050, it's about the uh, immediate and current uh, intervention. And also on freight transport, uh, the, mini the president did announce in SONA 
there's six of our uh, top land based border posts. So here I'm talking of Bay Bridge, Lebombo, Maseru, Copfontaine, Oshut, and Fitchback. We'll be going out uh, uh, to test the market. Uh, of course, we have uh, been working with the infrastructure fund. We are getting to uh, go to the market, invite private sector players so that we can modernize uh, those, uh, those ports of entry. Uh, increase and elevate the efficiency of the performance of those uh, of those border posts and therefore makes uh, our country more competitive and expand if you like uh, the, the, the the share of uh, south africa's participation on the african continent and beyond what are we doing on water of course on the reticulation side there are major problems with regards to the collapse of municipal water infrastructure waste water treatment works water treatment works the issues of uh, unaccounted for water. I did say when I started that is going to constitute the second phase of the work that we are doing. But what we are addressing now is on what we call the water resources side. So the kind of dams, the, the water balance that is here in the county. The president has announced the following that uh, we have uh, uh, through the infrastructure fund the Mukolo Crocodile uh, um, uh, augmentation project now we are ready, the financing has gone through the budget facility for infrastructure, attracted the necessary financing, so we're proceeding with that. The Ebenezer Olifant uh, Fontaine Augmentation Program, we're proceeding with that. We're working with the private sector on what we call Lebalelo and also Val Gamagara. Here we're talking of mining communities that uh, require water as a basic input for their purposes of production, but it's important from the public sector point of view that uh, the surrounding communities are able to enjoy reticulation. So they were introducing a, a, a delivery, an innovative delivery model where we are working with private sector to co-find the financing of, uh, of this uh, infrastructure. So this is the immediate, it's not about 2050, that's what we are addressing now. But for purposes of 2050, is to ensure that there's universal access. So every person, irrespective of your geographic location, when you open the tap, the pressure at the tap must be at the right levels, right quality, as and when you need it. So we know that in many parts of the country, as we speak now, there's a significant proportion of uh, population that share raw water with uh, animals. So it's something that requires uh, our immediate attention. So those are the interventions we're making. The president did announce a minister of finance that we have gone through, concluded the first phase of the Mzimbubu water project, ensure that uh, we are able to uh, exploit water resources in that part of uh, the country, the, the Eastern Cape there, to ensure that those communities enjoy uh, access to water. And also in this regard, we'll be working with the 10 big users, the municipalities, to address the issues around unaccounted for water, address the issues around the, the collapse of municipal water infrastructure, and then we'll continue to expand, like the minister has said, we're uh, expanding the capacity of reinforcing the capacity of the state to deliver on this kind of infrastructure, introducing a project management office. Its sole focus is to ensure that uh, we improve uh, municipal performance from an in water infrastructure point of view. So those are the current intervention that we're making. And then uh, on the last one, digital uh, communication. Again, we're talking about the NDP talks about reliable, affordable, fast internet access must be extended to all the, the households. So the ambition here is that uh, we should get to a stage where um, households have access to about 50 gigs of, uh, of internet access at the right speed. Of course, the Minister of uh, Telecommunications is working on uh, what percentage of that 50 gigs should be free, because we think that that percentage must articulate our ambition to create access to fast, reliable, affordable internet access as a, in the same manner as we treat municipal basic services water, sanitation, and energy. So you need to introduce that dispensation and the minister will articulate that. So what the, the, N, the NIP does, just articulates that ambition, sets what the timeline should be, and then the department will then go into, into that space. So what are we doing now? We know that we're connecting uh, public um, assets uh, like clinics, schools, and, and hospitals. We started with phase one of uh, SA Connect. Minister Nchaven will be introducing the delivery model for phase two of uh, SA Connect. Its primary intention is to connect the uh, public infrastructure. We know what uh, COVID has done, has surfaced, uh, if you like, the digital inequalities that exist. Uh, those in uh, um, uh, remote, uh, poor areas don't have the same amount of access compared to those who are in affluent, much more bigger cities. So it's important that we're able to address that. 
What have we done also immediate is to uh, the release of Spectrum, and I'm sure you know that the auction has been happening. I think I tracked it close to 12 billion, whatever the number is, and Minister Nchaveni has been championing that. The, the simple message here is that we're talking 2050, but the immediate interventions that we're doing, and I've attempted on all each of the four sectors to explain what is it that we're doing. And then uh, two things in conclusion, Minister um, 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 makes the point that part of the primary intention is to ensure that we reindustrialize and localize. So when you localize, of course, you are going to reindustrialize. So what we are doing from the infrastructure uh, point of view are stimulating the demand side, and then we are going to resuscitate, hopefully, the supply side. And of course, through policy instruments, you can be able to introduce tariffs. We are not articulating what those are, because DTIC will talk to that. We know already that uh, when you do construction of public assets, cement must be procured locally. So in that in that sense, we are able to provide see-through for the major um, um, cement manufacturers in the country. They are able to improve their capacity utilization. As we do that, we are employing more people, and as we employ more people, we bring down uh, uh, unemployment. So those are uh, some of uh, the relationship between infrastructure and our socioeconomic ambitions, I think, as a, as a sovereign nation. We want to address uh, and improve the quality of lives of uh, people going forward. So we've got ambition to access uh, the African market uh, through the instrument of the Africa continental free trade area, efficiency of the port, efficiency of the land border post, uh, freight transport from road to rail is going to be very important. And in that way, we're able to expand the reach, if you like, or the tentacles of uh, our uh, uh, locally owned uh, industrial uh, uh, capacity to access the, the African market and, and therefore uh, improve the GDP. And then in conclusion, Minister Dulil makes the point that we are going to take what we call a full life cycle approach to infrastructure. Part of the problem that is confronting us today is that we construct a road and then we move to the next project. So what we are introducing now, engendering in the approach is that there has to be a provision for maintenance of those assets. So you see now there's potholes, uh, uh, I mean major arterial, major corridors, even outside the municipal road. They are deteriorating because there is no investment on uh, on maintenance. And part of what we are introducing in this dispensation, around 8% of the value, rent value of your asset must be directed towards maintenance. So that's a discipline that we are introducing to ensure that we are able to address the issues around deterioration. Minister has spoken about protecting our infrastructure. You know the July, uh, 14 days in July last year, what it has done to uh, confidence, market confidence, investor confidence. So it's important that we're able to articulate a coherent and a compelling argument on how we're going to protect uh, this investment. And then, like I said, uh, on the financing part, we have introduced the infrastructure fund, blended financing mechanism, crowding private sector. The state is prepared to take the first loss, Mokolo Crocodile River, uh, the student housing um, infrastructure program, the social program, uh, uh, SA Connect, these are some of the projects that have benefited from the infrastructure fund that the president announced some time back, Minister Dilil operationalized it. Now the IF is up and running and we are able to produce the kind of results that we are articulating now. Of course, when we come to the next phase, we'll share with you some of the innovations that we are introducing in delivering social infrastructure. The president hinted in the State of the Nation address and the Minister of Finance did hint, so we're working on that mechanism. And I'm confident that uh, in the next uh, six weeks or so, Minister Dilil will come and share with the public on how we're going to um, introduce innovative financing instruments to ensure that we roll out um, uh, social infrastructure faster because the fiscal runway has uh, shortened, the fiscal space is diminishing, so we need to look at uh, other ways of addressing this situation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amahoba. Just to conclude, uh, just to share some progress with you on some of the projects that have been implemented already. Uh, as you all know, that the infrastructure investment plan uh, is a major part of the economic reconstruction and um, another other the recovery plan. <laughs> you know, all of the... <laughs> the acronyms that we are using. And it's a daunting task. And we, we know that we can't move 
uh, if you don't have the necessary resources. And, and, and right from the establishment of Infrastructure South Africa, we started pitching our, pro our projects and we've gone out to the market to look for funding. As we all know that our national, uh, t national treasury is not in a good space. So in June of 2020, we had our first investment conference. Then we continued again last year in November of 2021. And as you all know now on the 24th of March, uh, there'll be another investment conference. So we're actively going out and seeking that partnership from the private sector, from multilateral institutions, from development banks, and we have been very successful uh, because now we have got an infrastructure investment plan. So I, I, I really want to assure you that we are taking uh, the, the, the role out of infrastructure very seriously because it is one of the methodologies that can stimulate economic growth. So some of the concrete examples that I can give to you is that ESCOM. ESCOM is making good progress in splitting up into generation transmission and distribution divisions, and that is on track to establish a, an independent transmission uh, entity in this financial year. Uh, ESCOM has also now made a commitment uh, to transition into clean generation and to roll out transmission infrastructure in support of the new generation. Then, as we all know, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy has lifted the license limit of the embedded generation from one megawatt to a hundred. And, and these uh, reforms will have a dramatic impact on the supply of electricity and also to ensure electricity uh, uh, um, security. Then on Transnet Freight Rail, uh, they, they've been introducing third party operators into their, their branch network and is preparing for the introduction of uh, third party operators also in the main lines of, of Transnet. Um, uh, Transnet has also commercially separating their rail infrastructure from operations, and that target for, for separation is also in the current financial year, 2022 to 2023. And, and this is will further develop a whoop and wall service to promote private wagons on our rail infrastructure. Uh, they're also busy with uh, the reform in our port services uh, that has begun uh, with the establishment of the Transnet National Ports Authority, an independent subsidiary of Transnet, and work is going very smoothly there. But it's also adding value, like Dr. Namahopa is saying, by moving traffic of our roads onto, onto rail. So Santral has made significant projects in road infrastructure uh, with nine construction projects currently running at the value of 18 billion rand that's in progress and a further eight projects valued to 20 billion rand will be awarded, was awarded in the financial year of 2021. So there's been significant improvement in the water use efficiency over the past decade. But what we are seeing also is that the Department of Water and Sanitation has already started with the implementation of NIP 2050. On the digital space, we've also made progress. There's been good performance in digital infrastructure over the past decade. Um, by 2019, 93% of the population was covered with 4G, and that was up from 53% in 2015. Also, over 85% of the population lived within 10 kilometers of a fiber access point, and this coverage bodes well for the NIP 2050 efforts to improve uh, digital access, especially for low-income communities. And we have seen that there's an emerging appetite uh, and capability in South African capital markets to innovate the, the funding of, of infrastructure. For example, 
South Africa has issued the most green bonds in Africa with a cumulative uh, issuing values of 2.4 billion US dollars and a growing commitment by the South Africa state and the public-private partnership is to demonstrate that is demonstrated to the, the infrastructure fund. As Dr. Amahopa said, the infrastructure fund is operational. Government has committed 100 billion rand over 10 years. We've established an uh, infrastructure investment committee uh, comprising of both the public sector and the private sector. We meet once every three months as chaired by myself, and there we consider uh, uh, applications for funding like the, the port of entry that uh, Dr. Amahopa is referring to, uh, the total value to do all the one-stop shop and all the border posts is about 15 billion. So the infrastructure fund made 3.5 billion rand available, and because it's a blended fund, the private sector is now coming in to bring in, in the rest. Um, and, and, and through this infrastructure fund that we've established, we, we, we want to see the crowding in effect by the private sector in this blended fund. Now lastly, um, we will continue to give you updates, but I also want to invite you when we go and launch all of these projects. We no longer make announcements. We go there where the project, the foundation is there, there are people working on the site, like we've done last week in Nelson Mandela Bay, and, 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 and we will continue to, um, to, to only, only uh, prove to you that we are implementing. Uh, next week we are going to KwaZulu Natal. We have, um, in the past year, uh, we've only been able to deliver about 16 uh, rural bridges. As you know, the State of the Nation address is up there to 95. And so we will be rolling out, we've put together at least 24 teams uh, targeted KZN, Eastern Cape, Limpopo, Pumalanga, and the Free State provinces to build these rural bridges. And uh, next week we will be going to KZN to also deliver two rural bridges there. So this is just part of the progress that, that we are reporting to show that even though we are launching this uh, planned uh, right up to 2050, but we have already started implementing what we have committed to in the National Infrastructure Plan 2050. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we look forward to providing you with more information. Uh, we will continue to invite you to join us when we launch some of these projects. And, and I want to also thank the media uh, who has joined us on all of these pro, uh, launch of these projects for helping us uh, to, to inform our communities about government plans, although we are doing it ourselves also by doing social facilitation. On every big infrastructure project in a community, we go before we start and we say to the community, this is what we are going to do. This will, this will be the benefits for this community. How many local contractors, how many local job opportunities. And we found by doing that, to get the community to buy in from the beginning, that we are able to prevent later stoppages on the projects when some mafia crooks want to come and claim 30% of the projects. The communities are saying, but we are here, we are benefiting. So thank you very, very much for your attention. God bless. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amokupa.